Tuesday the 30th of July 2013. Rowan County Sheriff's Office, North Carolina. Two young men enter the police station to report their adopted younger sister as missing. But when the investigators ask them when she went missing, and the two young men tell them that they last saw their 13 year old sister two years ago, a twisted case of lies, fraud, abuse, and murder begins to unravel. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Erica Lynn Parsons was born on the 28th of February 1998 to her biological mother, Carolyn Parsons, weighing just four pounds and seven ounces. Sadly, within days of giving birth to Erica, Carolyn Parsons realised that she couldn't care for her newly born daughter. You see, Carolyn Parsons tragically did not have the money to look after Erica, and so she knew that to do the right thing, she needed to give her baby up for adoption. Erica was described as being a happy baby who Caroline could cuddle up to and who would fall straight to sleep. Erica's biological father had not been in the picture, so Caroline's former brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Casey Parsons and Sandy Parsons, offered to adopt Erica. Caroline had spent her childhood in foster care and she knew from the moment she first held her daughter that she wanted more for her, and she felt that Casey and Sandy adopting Erica would grant her daughter, Erica, a life and home that she couldn't provide for her. And so, at four weeks old, Erica was adopted by Casey and Sandy Parsons and joined their family. It's unclear when exactly Sandy Parsons and Casey Parsons met, and when they got married. But what we do know is that on the 8th of May 1992, Casey gave birth to the couple's first child, Sandy Wade Parsons Jr. in Concord, North Carolina. And the following year, on the 24th of March 1993, the couple's second son, James Parsons, known as Jamie, was born in China Grove, North Carolina. In 1994, it was reported in my sources that evidence of violence had emerged within the family home. Violence which ultimately saw Sandy Parsons being found guilty of assaulting his wife Casey and being ordered to serve three years probation. The judge also ordered Sandy to not assault, harass, or molest Casey. The couple seemingly remained together after these charges and rulings had been made, with them welcoming their third child the following year in 1995, a daughter by the name of Brooke Parsons. On the 15th of November of that same year, 1995, Casey underwent an operation to get tubal ligation. In other words, she got her tubes tied. Not much else is known about what happened within the family from that point, up until 1997, that is. In 1997, Sandy was once again charged with and convicted of assault against his wife, Casey, and is subsequently sentenced to a year probation and ordered to undergo community service. And even with that second conviction in 1997 of assault, both Sandy and Casey are still granted the adoption of Erica by the state when it is approved by Cabarrus County on the 23rd of March in the year 2000. The state found that Casey and Sandy were quote, fit to have care and custody of said child. It must be noted that Sandy would actually claim that the official adoption had gone through in July of the year 2000 rather than in the March, but whatever the case, the couple were still granted custody of Erica. Here's what Casey had to say about the adoption, quote, we got her at four weeks old. She was placed with us, but she wasn't legally adopted until July in the year 2000. She was two and a half years old. Erica has three half siblings that also got at the same time. Time. We had seven kids, three of our biological kids, and four that we got in at the time when we got her. And we had them seven kids all the way up until August 1998, when the other three were placed with other adopted families that they did get adopted with. And we already had her for weeks, and she was already calling me mama, and we couldn't let her go at that point, so we, the social workers, agreed to, 
we were the ones who learned her how to walk and talk, and we were the only parents she knew at that point, and she called us mama and daddy. In 2001, Casey advertised herself online as a surrogate mother, and it had been online where she had met Amy Miller, a mother who would hire Casey to be her surrogate. Amy Miller hired Casey on the 27th of August 2001, and this is what Amy would later say about Casey. She just seemed very wholesome very down to earth, very religious. The fact that she adopted Erica to keep her in the family, I thought that was a real, you know, that was admirable is what I thought. In September of 2001, Amy Miller's embryo was transferred into Casey's uterus. Quote, she came to my house, her and her son, Jamie, stayed for three weeks. We got the positive pregnancy. She went back home. Though when Casey was six weeks along, Casey rung up Amy Miller and told her that she had sadly miscarried and lost the baby. Strangely, shortly after informing Amy of the miscarriage, Casey changed her phone number and her email address and began to send Amy Miller nasty emails telling her that she would never get her doctor's records from her to prove that she had miscarried and that she was glad that it hadn't worked out. She changed her phone number. She changed her email. She told me I needed to get a life. I had no business having a child. About six months after Casey had allegedly miscarried, Amy Miller logged onto a surrogacy website and came across a message that had been posted by one of Casey Parsons' family members that said, quote, looking for the Michigan couple that works with Casey, I have some wonderful news for you. This family member revealed to Amy that Casey had still been pregnant and that she had set up a crib in her bedroom and had been planning on keeping the baby. Once it had been confirmed that Casey Parsons had still been pregnant with Amy Miller's child, an investigation was launched. Amy Miller learns that Casey Parsons had actually been taking money from at least two other couples while she had been pregnant. It had been Amy Miller's belief that Casey had set out to steal her child. Legal action was immediately threatened against Casey Parsons and the FBI was informed of the situation, which ultimately saw Casey doing the right thing and giving Amy Miller her child after the birth. Quote, questions were raised about Casey Parsons' role and motives as a surrogate mother under an agreement she had made with a couple from another state. In a letter, the couple's attorney said that they had learned that Parsons had told the couple that she had lost her baby to a miscarriage and that wasn't true. The attorney also said that they had evidence that Parsons was shopping their unborn child, trying to find other prospective parents who would pay for the child. The attorney told the Parsons that the FBI had been notified and that they could be prosecuted for kidnapping if they tried to keep the child. In March of 2002, the Department of Social Services began investigating allegations that Erica had been abused in the home two years previously, when she had been about two years old. The Department of Social Services, or DSS, began to investigate a report that Erica had been hit with a belt which had left bruises. The person who had filed the report with DSS had claimed that Casey would carry a belt around with her and use that belt to whip Erica. The allegation had been that Casey had beaten Erica, who had sustained marks on her buttocks, one on the back of her leg, and a couple to the side of her face. Further, it was alleged that Erica wouldn't eat food and that Casey had said that she didn't love her. When the DSS interviewed Casey, she denied abusing her children, and the DSS investigator made notes that Erica did not appear to have been afraid of either of her parents and that she would sit on their laps without hesitation. Further, the DSS worker found no signs of cuts, bruises, or scratches on Erica, though it was noted that she had been a small four-year-old child that only weighed just about 41 pounds. And so the DSS case concluded with a safety plan being agreed to by Casey and Sandy Parsons, in which they agreed to use alternate forms of discipline, such as timeouts and groundings, and agreed not to leave any marks or bruises from spankings and to provide a safe, stable home for the children. On the 1st of March, 2003, Casey Parsons traveled to Mexico to have her tubes untied, which she documented in a blog post she posted online. In August of that same year, Eric Erica began attending Boston Elementary School in China Grove, where she would be a student until July of 2004. A member of staff from the school spoke with the media about Erica and said, quote, I remember that I saw her individually sometime. I remember her smile and how she brushed her bangs out of her eyes if she felt anxious. She would beam when praised and she was hesitant when she thought she might not know the answer to a question. That's when she would brush her bangs away from her eyes and puff air out of her mouth. 
I recall how she tilted her head to one side and would smile, and that she loved stickers. In January of 2004, Casey made a post on her website that she had found out that she was pregnant, with a due date of the 11th of September of that same year. It had also been in 2004 when another DSS complaint was filed against Casey and Sandy. The authorities responded to the family home within 24 hours, and spoke with the parents and with the children. It had been reported that Erica was very tiny and frail, and that Casey he didn't want Erica anymore and had tried to give her away. The parents denied to DSS that they had used any corporal punishments, but that they would both holler at their children and would rather raise their voices than whip the children. They explained that Erica would throw up food if she didn't like it and was seeing a doctor for gastro issues. Both of the parents denied threatening to take food away from Erica or saying that they didn't care if she ate again, and they stated that they never tried to give Erica away. When the social workers interviewed Erica alone, they noted that she presented as small for her age. Erica told this social worker that when she does something bad, she has time out or isn't allowed to do certain things, and if she does something really bad, she might get a whipping. Erica also told the social worker that she likes to eat macaroni and pizza. Notably, the social worker observed Erica to have been well bonded with both Casey and Sandy, and that she presented as a happy child. Ultimately, the DSS case ended with a safety plan being agreed with the parents that they must agree to seek medical attention if the child continues to have eating problems or does not advance developmentally. Though the investigators also found substantiated neglect due to necessary medical remedial care not being provided, and so Erica was placed with an aunt. This aunt noted that Erica had been very small and that she had been in the first grade and wore three T-sized clothes. As Erica lived with this aunt, she began to eat and play normally and began to gain weight. Erica also revealed to this aunt that Casey and Sandy hit her. Importantly though, this aunt never tried to gain legal custody of Erica, which meant that eight months later, when Sandy and Casey wanted Erica back, they were granted custody again. That same year, Erica began to attend Shady Brook Elementary School, and on the 20th of August 2004, Casey Parsons gave birth to her daughter, Sadia. A year later, in 2005, Casey posts online that she had lost a baby in August, that she was now pregnant again with a due date for June 10th, 2006. And in September of 2005, it emerged that Casey had owned and was running a company called Carolina Tailwaggers, which, according to some sources, had been a chihuahua puppy mill, though not much information is available about this. In November, it is reported that Erica began to get homeschooled at the Parsons Christian Homeschool. You see, on the 21st of November, Casey and Sandy opened the Parsons Christian School as religious school located at the home address, with Casey as the chief administrator. Quotes, Erica Parsons was taught at the Parsons Christian School, a homeschool started by Casey Parsons in 2005 when Erica was seven. The state doesn't do background checks on homeschool administrators, and Casey never filed reports on the progress of her students, known only in state records as three females and one male. Casey Parsons also did not file the scores on the annual achievement tests the students were required to take. In fact, the state has no way of knowing whether the Parsons Christian School still exists. After Erica began her homeschool education, information about what she got up to and her home life is sparse. That was until 2010, when this picture of Erica was taken. On the 4th of February 2010, Erica's adoptive older brother, James Parsons, known as Jamie, was charged at the age of 16 by China Grove Police for misdemeanor simple assault for biting his three-year-old brother on the arm to, quote, see if he could bring blood to the surface. And that brings us to that day in July the 30th in 2013 when Jamie walks into the Brown County Sheriff's Office and reported Erica as missing. Let's take a listen to how he described what he said to the police that day. I think my sister's been missing and we're being told she's with Nan, this woman named Nan, but I don't think it's true. Jamie Parsons told them that in December 2011, his parents told him Erica had gone to visit her biological grandmother. Jamie says the story seemed strange, and he recalls his father, Sandy, seemed distraught. He was whiter than a piece of paper. Oh. He wasn't. He, all this color in his skin was gone. All the color. He told me his thoughts went to the previous night, the last time he had seen Erica. She was gray. She kept really brief. She was tired, and she 
she told Casey, I, I can't breathe. And Casey told her to shut the f get back in the corner. And I woke up the next day and that was gone. When Jamie had awoken in November or December of 2011 and realized Erica, who had been 13 years old at the time, was not at the home, he grew worried. And so he asked his parents, Sandy and Casey, where his sister Erica was. And they told him that they had been to Asheville, North Carolina, and given Erica to her biological grandmother, a woman by the name of Irene Goodman. Irene was also known as Nan or Nana. He explained to the police that that was the last time that he had seen his sister. An investigation into the disappearance of Erica was immediately launched by the authorities. We searched every square inch of that house. They uh, pulled up floorboards in the, um, some of the closets, doing probes in the yard, looking for you know, clandestine greys, and every place that we knew they'd been, we'd searched. Um, they, they had moved a lot. Got calls all over the place from psychics, people seeing her on the side of the road, or I thought I saw her here. And it's hard when you can't tell the public and the national news and the local news and state news every little step you make because there was just so much going on, you know, different officers doing different things in the case, running down different leads. Publicly quiet, but pushing hard behind the scenes to find Erica. The SBI and FBI joined in the investigation, offering rewards for her safe return. A lot of people failed Erica, and we were not gonna let that happen. We were not gonna fail her. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created an age progression photo turning an image of Erica at age nine into what she could look like at 15. Those pictures were plastered on billboards, part of the massive effort to generate tips. This case would haunt us if we didn't find her. When the authorities spoke with Casey and Sandy, they claimed that they had last seen Erica in December of 2011 in Mooresville at a McDonald's. And they told the investigators that Erica's biological grandmother, Irene Goodman, had contacted them via Facebook and had asked them whether she could start a relationship with Erica, her granddaughter. Sandy and Casey claims that they let Irene take Erica to Asheville, but that they hadn't seen her since. They told the authorities that they had gone with their daughter Brooke to take Erica to meet with Irene Goodman, though it must be noted that when the investigators spoke with Brooke, she stated that she had stayed home with the other children. Further, Casey and Sandy were unable to provide the investigators with any contact information for Irene Goodman. They couldn't even provide the profile of Irene Goodman's Facebook account, which they alleged she had used to originally contact them with. Detective Chad Moose had been the lead detective on the case, and he was quickly tasked with trying to track down Irene Goodman so they could check on the well-being of Erica. He started by trying to locate anyone with the name Irene Goodman, or similar names who lived in Asheville. And while there had been people that had that name or similar names, none of them had been related to Erica. According to one source, on the 31st of July, the two youngest children in the Parsons family home were actually removed by the state, but I was unable to find any more information about that. Detective Chad Moose then made the announcement in August of 2013 that the police believed the story about Erica's biological grandmother had been fake, and that they had tracked down everyone with the name Goodman in Asheville but couldn't find Erica or her biological grandmother. The investigators also made a point to state that Sandy and Casey were not cooperating with the authorities in their announcement. On the 12th of August, Erica's biological mother, Carolyn, flew in from New Orleans to North Carolina in order to speak with the investigators about Erica's disappearance. And it was on that same day that Casey and Sandy filmed a segment in LA for The Dr. Phil Show. And in September of 2013, a month after the investigators had revealed that Irene didn't actually exist, Casey decided to allow the media to enter her home, which gives us a glimpse into the environment in which Erica would have lived in. Casey Parsons showed us one of the two bedrooms Erica lived in prior to her disappearance in December of 2011. We look for her every day. We still do. Now, as I just briefly mentioned, Casey and Sandy went on the Dr. Phil show in order to discuss their case. And unfortunately, I am unable to show clips from that episode in this video due to Dr. Phil's team being very strict on their copyrights. But what we will do is go over the main points from the segments. Casey claims on the show that Erica had cut off communications with them. Apparently, Irene 
Goodman had told Casey that Erica had said that she didn't want to go back home after having lived with Irene Goodman for two months. And about a week and a half later, when Casey tried to call Irene, the phone line stated that the number was not receiving calls anymore. This led Casey to believe that 13-year-old Erica had blocked their number. Both Casey and Sandy insisted on the show that they believe that Erica is fine and that they don't have a doubt in their minds about it. They reiterated that Erica was not missing and that they thought she was just being a rebellious teenager. The couple further claims that they believe that they had been the model parents and that all of their kids' needs had been met. But the detectives on the case knew deep down that something wasn't adding up, that the couple were hiding something, and they knew that all they had to do was separate the couple and soon one of them would break so that they could learn the truth and find Erica. If they weren't together, they wouldn't talk, and the authorities got the impression that Casey had some kind of control over Sandy. But separating the couple seems like a task that was next to impossible. That was until the investigators uncovered a major mess up, a major mistake that the couple had made, a mistake with their money. As it turned out, Sandy Parsons and Casey Parsons had been collecting adoption assistance and food stamps, programs that receive federal funding, benefits that were intended for Erica. And despite them not having custody of Erica for two years, they had still been collecting those benefits. Quote, Sandy Parsons and Casey Parsons had been working together to enrich themselves with Erica's benefits. This meant that the FBI was now involved and investigating the Parsons for benefits fraud. And in 2014, Casey Parsons and Sandy Parsons were arrested on 76 counts of federal fraud charges and identity theft. Notably, members of the jury stated that they didn't buy Sandy Parsons' defense, that Casey had been the mastermind behind the benefits fraud, and that he didn't have any knowledge of the household finances. And in March of 2015, the couple were finally separated and imprisoned, with a combined 18 years of federal prison time. Though, tragically, Erica remained missing. That was until 2016, when a crucial break in the case was made. From behind the bars of his jail cell, and after more than three years of fabricating the truth, Sandy Parsons finally broke and came clean. He confessed to the investigators that Erica had tragically been dead for five years, passing away when she was 13 years old. In September of 2016, Sandy Parsons was escorted with the authorities to rural Chesterfield in South Carolina, which had been in an area where Casey Parsons, his wife, had once lived, and they'd gone there in order for Sandy to locate Erica's body. You can see in this footage Sandy Parsons being taken to the location where he claimed Erica's body was. We see him confirm the spot. This here? I think so. Okay. That's it, man. He gets out, and within three minutes, he's able to locate the shallow grave where he and his wife Casey had discarded the remains of 13-year-old Erica Lynn Parsons. According to Detective Chad Moose, Sandy Parsons became somber and tearful. Sandy's confession also revealed the extreme measures that he and his wife had gone to in order to hide the death of Erica back in December of 2011. This is his version of events. It had been in December of 2011 when Sandy had woken up to Casey, telling him that Erica had died. Casey told Sandy that she had placed Erica inside of a tote in a plastic container. Erica would remain in that plastic container for two days while Sandy and Casey decided what to do with her remains. In the meantime, the family continued on as normal and even went to a Christmas party. This receipt that I'm showing on screen right now shows bleach that the couple had purchased and used to pour over Erica's remains after her death. And it's important to note that the couple actually visited the road in Chesterfield County where they'd leave Erica's remains in a shallow grave twice. The first time had been to dig the grave and the second time had been to abandon her remains there. The couple had even removed the batteries from their cell phones when they went to the burial location to avoid any chance of them being tracked. Though, after nearly five years of being concealed in the bush of the woods, Erica had finally been found and she could finally be laid to rest. The authorities delicately recovered Erica's remains with Detective Chad Moose ensuring to go the extra mile for the 13-year-old girl. Erica's remains were placed in a body bag, though the bag was left open by Detective Chad Moose so that Erica wouldn't be left in the dark anymore. Detective Chad Moose even went as far as to place a stuffed animal in the body bag as her remains were transported back to Rowan County. He ensured that Erica received the dignity and respect that she never got when she was alive. Quote, Erica got more love from the community 
than she ever did from her adoptive family. It had been clear to the investigators that Casey Parsons had been the mastermind behind what had happened, and so they decided not to immediately tell Casey that they had found Erica's remains, giving her one last chance to confess. Hey, Miss Parsons. Hey. This is Chad Luke of the Sheriff's Office, Rowan County. How are you? Fine. I know Erica isn't on the third thing. Oh, yes, she is. She's not. Yes, she is. I lied. No, yes, not. she is. Y'all will find that out. Because this, there's nothing I've done like that. I would never do anything like that in my life to anybody. So you're saying you didn't take Erica's body anywhere? Fanny didn't take Erica's body anywhere? No. Okay, so if I find a body of a little girl on faith on her Mount Krogan near Pagel, South Carolina, it's not going to be Erica. It's not going to be Erica. Okay. And how do you know that? Because she's alive. So your statement is, never beat Erica. I never. Did you ever pull braces off her too? Oh, she did that. Did you ever bend a fingers back back to No. Okay, have you ever choked her? To? No. And never beat her with Sandy Bell? No. Did you ever make her eat dog food? Oh my God, no. If I find her and she's bones and I got broken bones, you got nothing to do with none of that. I have nothing to do with that. If you change your mind and you want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. you better hurry. Okay. okay. Right, I'm fine. Erica's remains were received by the medical examiner on the 14th of October 2016, and the medical examiner spent three months studying every segment of Erica's skeleton. It was immediately clear that Erica had sustained injuries prior to death, and horrifyingly, she had sustained a considerable amount of them. I had never seen the level of trauma that was written because it was everywhere. They were extensive and all over. Yes, they were extensive all over and range from her face, torso, back, arms. This poor child had been beaten uh, chronically for a very long time. She was tortured. She was an old injury that her, this part was crooked and it was um, turned. All of the trauma to the part of the back of your shoulder blade from beatings that you had new bone growing on top of bone and growing and micro fractures. So that means she was repeatedly beaten and her bones were trying to heal themselves. Yes. To only be broken again. Yes. Erica's brother, James Parson or Jamie, spoke about the horrors that he witnessed his parents inflict on Erica. Watching Erica get beat, that wasn't normal. And beat with what? Uh, the belt. Uh, mostly the remote. She had actually, Daddy made a joke one time. It was an awful joke because it said that we go through more remotes than any family does because we don't lose them. Casey breaks them over Erica. Erica would actually do something wrong. She got what Casey called the friendly reminders. And basically she bent her hand, closed her thing, opened up her palm of her hand, and completely bend her fingers back until it touched the wrist. Erica not only endured this physical abuse and violence, she was also starved. Food was withheld from Erica for long enough periods that it actually stunted her growth, with the length of her long bones being equivalent to that of a nine-year-old. The length of her long bones were equivalent to that of, an, uh, of a nine-year-old. Usually in fatal starvation cases, you either get fatal starvation or you get physical abuse, you rarely have both of them going on at once in one case because it's a different kind of mindset. That is considered torture. You can't even do that to prisoners of war. The level of hatred that that woman had for this kid. You can feel the hatred that they had for Erica through the family photos that were taken. You can see Erica's siblings happy, joyful, having a good time. But there in the background, Erica is stood facing the corner. And this is captured in multiple family photos, time and time again. The pain my heart feels when I see these images is simply unexplainable. I cannot begin for a second to even fathom the pain that Erica had gone through. Seeing her siblings be rewarded, be happy, while she was physically abused, starved, and made to stand in the corner. 
It's just not comprehensible. On the 18th of June 2017, Erica was finally laid to rest in a funeral paid for by the Rowan County community. It was attended by hundreds of people, the community ensuring that Erica received the love she deserved. On the 20th of February 2018, Casey Parsons and Sandy Parsons were both charged with first degree murder, felony child abuse, felony concealment of death, and obstruction of justice in connection to Erica's death. On the 2nd of August 2019, Casey pled guilty in Rowan County Superior Court to murder and child abuse in Erica's murder. When she finally confessed, she was described as being cold and callous. She admitted to the horrendous abuse and showed no remorse. This is the statement that Casey gave to the court when she pled guilty. Um, first, I want to say, I'm going to ask you, Caroline, but why? I can't, I can't tell you why. I don't know why I did this stuff. I did. I'm sorry, sorry. But God gave me a precious gift, a baby girl, Erica, and he had trusted me to take care of her. And I failed him and I failed Erica. I failed her horribly. My parents and my sister reached out to me numerous times to help me. Numerous. Um, I pushed them back. I would lie constantly to them. And they would try over and over again. I was supposed to protect Erica. In the end, I failed her by choosing one child over another child. This cat, this costed her her life that time. And I want to say I'm sorry to God and to Erica. Sandy also pled guilty to second degree murder and child abuse. Bizarrely, Sandy had believed that he had made a deal with the FBI in order to reduce his sentence, even though no such deal had been made. Whatever the case, Casey Parsons remains behind bars in a prison in Tallahassee, Florida, serving 10 years for fraud, and she will begin a life sentence for murder this year in 2024. Sandy Parsons remains behind bars in Fess in New Jersey, serving eight years for fraud and 33 to 43 years for the murder of Erica Lynn Parsons. He will be eligible for parole at the age of 82. And through all of this, Casey Parsons and Sandy Parsons remained married, and no clear motive has ever been established. It is of my view that they were two simply evil people who thought of Erica as less than an animal, something that they could take their anger out on, torture and starve. We can only hope that Erica is at peace now, with justice served, and that the state to re-examine their policies and safeguarding techniques to ensure something like this never happens again. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case True Crime series. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to see more true crime content just like this one, and click on that bell icon to be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video. You can find the sources of my research down below in the description. You can also find all my social media and also a link to the Spotify podcast version of this episode if you'd rather listen to my true crime videos in podcast form. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case.